Amen. And we are so looking forward to sharing the time with you. We're in the Gospel of St. John. If you'll go there in your Bible, you can follow along with me today. We'll be in the fourth chapter up to now. The Apostle John has presented Christ as the Son of God. Jesus has been presented as the Lamb of God by John the Baptist. He's been witnessed to by the Father at his baptism. The disciples have given testimony to the fact that he's the Messiah. But noticeably, through all of this, if you've been watching as you read the gospel in your devotional time, Jesus has never acknowledged any of it. They have acknowledged him. He has never acknowledged them. Now what makes this portion that we're going to look at today in John chapter 4 so interesting is that if you've read the other gospel accounts, the declaration that's about to come is going to come from the lips of Jesus, and the revelation that's going to come is not going to be given in a national, political, religious center of Israel in Jerusalem or at some great function. He's going to be tucked away somewhere where he probably shouldn't be as far as the culture is concerned. But rather, he gives this information to a woman, but not just to a woman, but who, a woman to whom in every other sense is an outcast. She's a Samaritan, and as far as the Jews of Jesus' day were concerned, the Samaritans were essentially a corrupted form of the Jewish race. They were the Jews that had been left behind after Israel had been decimated in 722. They'd wiped out the entire nation and all that they had left behind when they took Daniel and his entire cohort away in three separate exodus events was a few folks just scattered in the fields. That's all they left behind. And then they moved in some new people. The Assyrians came in and took over the property. And over time, these folks up in Samaria had intermarried, and that was a largely forbidden thing in Judaism. In fact, it was the most heinous crime a Jew could commit was to intermarry with these idolatrous Gentiles far from the circle, far from the faith, far from everything that they believed in. So by the time we get to Jesus' day, these folks were outcasts. The woman that Jesus is about to talk to is in total contrast to the man that he spoke with last week that we talked about, Nicodemus. Nicodemus, well-dressed, well-informed, very religious, totally spiritually blind, but had a very good understanding of Scripture. There were so many things Jesus didn't have to say to Nicodemus. But to this woman, well, this was going to be different. It's actually quite amazing. It's a testimony, actually, to who he was. He came unto his own, John said in the first chapter, and his own did not receive him. And this chapter 4 is a testimony that salvation is for everybody. And to those who were his own that did not receive, that was beside the point. He came for every people from every tribe and tongue and nation. He did not come for the Jews. They thought this was a Jewish Messiah. He was their leader. It was going to be all good. He was their man when this Messiah came. But when Messiah came, he said, I'm coming through the Jewish race, but it matters squat about you. People make a big deal of Jewishness, and I like to be proud of my heritage too. It's not worth a penny or a peanut more than mine. And Jesus makes that in his ministry abundantly clear. That it's for the whole world. In fact, in John chapter 3 and verse 16... Jesus said what we read last week, that God so loved what? The world. It's not a nationalist thing. It's not an American thing. It's not a Jewish thing. 
It's not a Canadian thing. We are citizens of heaven. Not much to do with here. Here we're just doing our time, making the investments that are required. In him, the Bible said to, God said to Abraham, in this Messiah, all the world would be blessed. Peter says in Acts chapter 10, now I know for certain that God doesn't show favoritism with people, but treats everyone on the same basis. It makes no difference the race of people one belongs to. Did you see that? If they show deep reverence for God, they are committed to doing what's right. They are what? Acceptable. Everybody can be acceptable to God. You can't play the race card with God. The gospel messenger that you connect with may have issues. Other believers may have inappropriate attitudes or speak out of alignment with true godliness. But please, please, don't confuse the messenger with the Almighty. Don't mix up the family with the Father. Those are two different entities. That's why when the Great Commission came, Jesus told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go make disciples where? Of all the nations, from everywhere. In fact, when we get back to Acts this summer, you're going to see the biggest problem Jesus had is that his disciples, the 12, can say these words, but they're stuck. Watch, the apostles... As much as we read in Acts, never leave Jerusalem. They're stuck. And God has to bring in extra people, a man by the name of Barnabas. And he hauls in another fellow by the name of Paul. Then he has to blow the whole thing up in persecution in order to get the message beyond the borders of Israel. Because like Israel, we tend to be happy with us four no more, bless God. My family's in. My family's all right. I feel sorry for those poor folks at work. I feel sorry for that poor fella next door. Well, I don't know about your uncle, but bless God, we're in. He came into his own, and his own did not receive him, but to as many as would receive him. It's an international word. So here is a demonstration that the gospel is intended for anyone and everyone who believes, no matter what their ethnic identity or their social status or station in life. And I say this to remind you and me as I was preparing that we testify to the work of Christ as a fulfillment of the Great Commission, and the Great Commission is all the world. All the world. Now, the message this morning isn't about take, is all about taking you back to the event itself. I'm not going to try and update it for you. I hope we can learn some things from Jesus today about how to approach people in the world who are indifferent to the gospel. Nicodemus came and sought Jesus out. You remember that last week? This woman could care less. She never met him. She never knew him. She wasn't connected to him. If she had not connected with him that day, she would not have missed him. He's a complete unknown, an unsought stranger that she happens to meet sitting at a well. And in the course of conversation, we will watch Jesus dismiss her coldness and offense concerning his Jewish heritage. That's not going to be a barrier. He'll walk past it. He dismisses her ignorance about Scripture. That's not a barrier. He walks past it. He'll dismiss her gender because being a female in that culture, we'll talk about it in a minute, is a a factor. But he's going to walk past it. Her lifestyle... And this is important. He dismisses. He walks past her immorality. I know we get all uptight and very self-righteous, and we look at our immoral world and sexual identity as it's promoted there, then it's easy for us to have resentment towards people who, from our perspective as Christians, are just corrupting our culture and influencing our people in the wrong way. They're the people we disapprove of. But Jesus, again, took my head this week and spun me around And said to me, look again, that's the mission field, not the enemy. 
And there's a huge difference there. You see, the Bible says this, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We're not fighting people. People are broken. People are bent by sin out of shape. And we're all, because we're broken, under the influence of rulers against dark authorities and the powers of this dark world, the archons of the world, Paul writes, the exousia, the privileged authorities, the cosmocrators are the world rulers of this dark world, and they're all spiritual entities. He said, if you want to identify the enemy, there it is. These are the influencers that are driving your kids, that are driving your neighbors, that are driving your government, that are driving everybody else outside of the circle, and they're broken, and they receive it. They're under their influence, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we overcome. But the people, the people, they're not the enemy. They're the mission field. When Jesus called Matthew the tax collector another unacceptable profession in his day to follow him and be his disciple, Matthew, you know, remember Matthew threw a party, invited all his fellow tax collectors to the party, the local Jewish leadership voiced their disapproval, got bent out of shape at Jesus' attendance and association with these unacceptable, undesirable folks. And Jesus fronts them right up with these words. Whoops, yeah, not against human people. But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. He tells to the religious people, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so no matter what you may, have, you may think or may have been told, can I tell you this? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he hasn't changed his policy. He hasn't changed his purposes he hasn't altered his principles. This is simply the way it is. So having said that, as we go through this story, we're going to learn some principles for approaching people that we see our Lord using here. I find them very helpful. I wanted to skip some, but every time I tried to pull something else out of the message, I got the nudge and shoved it back in and tried to be a good boy. Be patient with me. Dear God, help. Let's pray. Father, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to understand what it is you're trying to teach us and remind us of today as we go through this marvelous story and remember you and all you did for all of us. Amen. John chapter 4 and verse 1, here's what it says. Now when the Lord learned that the Pharisees had heard of Jesus gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, it was his disciples. He left Judea and went back to Galilee. Jesus' ministry starts to flourish. He's been down in the south at Passover, and things are starting to pick up speed. He's starting to gain some momentum, but he sees a conflict coming with the religious leadership. It's not time for the conflict yet, so what does he do? He packs it in. He packs it in and walks away. And the Bible says that in verse 4, he had needs go through Samaria. There's a really simple map. It will help you see where he is. He's been down in the south in Judea. That's a region of Israel. In the middle was Samaria. And above, where that second little lake is at the top, is Galilee. And that's where he's headed. And we could argue that it was the shortest route but you have to know that most Jews would avoid Samaria. They'd find a way around it. They did not wish to go through it. But we could argue that though it was the shortest route and Jesus seems to be in a hurry to get back, but you and I both know that Jesus' prayer life early in the morning is guiding every step of his, his journey. And so when he gets up that morning and decides he's on his way back, the Bible says he had to pass through Samaria. The Greek of that said he was required to. 
He'd been up in the morning, this is my take on it, and God had said, no, not that way, this way. He said, this way, this way, all right, whatever you say. He had to go that way. It was established for him. Verse number 5. And eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. So Jesus has journeyed about 20 miles. He's hot-footed it since this morning. It's rather a rigorous walk, 20 miles. Anybody here walk 20 miles a day? Not me. I know you couldn't tell, but just in case there was any questions. So Jesus got up in the morning, and they did 20 miles. When he gets to Jacob's well in Sychar in Samaria, he's, um, he's what I would be. He's tired. It says in the scripture that it was around noon. Jesus, weary from the long walk, sat beside the well at noon. It's high noon in Israel. The sun is at its peak. He's walked 20 miles since morning in a rigorous walk. He is now exhausted. The word that is used there for Jesus is tired or weary, depending on your translation, means to sweat to the point of exhaustion. He has had his morning workout. Hallelujah. He did 20 miles with the disciples, and they were hustling to keep up. Finally, they pulled it over, and Jesus is spent. So at noon, under the blazing sun, he sits down by the well. I want you to see there the humanity of Jesus, that he knows how we suffer. He knows what it's like to be weary. He knows what it's like to have to get somewhere and push until you get there. He understands what we suffer. He knows what it's like to be weary, to be thirsty, to be worn out, to be exhausted. That's what makes him a sympathetic high priest. He's learned through his own experiences to sympathize with us. In my mind, that kind of brings shame on those who say you have to touch with, get in touch with Mary or the saints because that's, 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 those are the folks who give us sympathy. Can I say this to you? Balderdash. Your Savior knows. Your Savior knows where you are. He's walked where you are. Why would you go through the underlings? Talk to the boss. You have the privilege. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. Come to Christ. Speak with him. Let's go there first. So now the stage is set for this little encounter that's about to happen. And I want to give you six things as we go through for personal evangelism that I watched Jesus do in here. If you've got a pen, you might want to scratch them down on our way through. The first thing I see here is an unexpected attentiveness that is offered. Verse 7. Then there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Now I have to stop for a moment because drawing water was a woman's task. Men worked in the fields during the day. And the ladies, just tradition had it, they were the ones that went out to draw the water. They did it every day. They did it because they needed water every day. There was no running water. The water only ran as fast as the women. Water was scarce in that part of the world, as you know. So a well was a place you visited every day. It was the common meeting place for the women, and they typically came at dusk. Now, we know that Jesus is there according to John's documentation when? High noon. So it would be reasonably a reasonable thing to assume that the woman was a woman from town who had a bad reputation in the community. The Samaritan religion was based on a limited reading of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament which contains the Ten Commandments and a lot of other things that have to do with marriage, divorce, and adultery. This is a scarlet woman, to steal the words from Nathaniel Hawthorne. She would normally have come at dusk, but if she was a woman or shame or ashamed, she would come at another time. She didn't want to encounter the other women, 
because of what would be said when they encountered each other. She's staying out of reach. She's staying out of the way. The other thing we know from this region is that the city of Sychar or Askar, which is what we assume it is now, it's about a mile to a mile, in a, to, to, it's a half a mile to a mile. Okay, you can tell I'm in the old imperial system still. <laughs> away from the city. And there are other wells on the way. Why is this woman, first of all, going out at high noon, and why is she going to the furthest point? She doesn't want to connect with anybody. That's our assumption. Why? She's made some lifestyle choices. She's avoiding confrontation and the stigma that are the consequences of her lifestyle. Why is this? Well, because there's information historically that there's a number of other places she could have gone. But she avoids the convenient places, the places a normal routine might take someone to avoid the scorn of the other women. So therefore, we assume, knowing a little more about the story, this is not a respectable person in the community. The other thing we can assume then is that by all standards of religious practice, even up in Samaria, this woman does not deserve the attention of the Son of God. She's totally unworthy. If Jesus is going to appear anywhere, it's not going to be to her. If Messiah is coming, he wouldn't talk to somebody like that. And she assumes the same thing. So when she sees the man sitting at the well, she assumes no interaction. So like you and I, when we connect with somebody that's outside the circle of faith, we do what Jesus did. We give them unexpected attentiveness. Hmm. We don't think of this as aggressive, but you have to know what Jesus does is very aggressive because in this culture, men and women don't talk unless they're married. You don't talk with women when you're outside of the house unless it's your own immediate family. They do this to avoid temptation. It's just a cultural thing that men do. Men speak with one another. Women speak with one another. The twain do not mix. It's a breach of etiquette. So here is Jesus, young rabbi. You've got to see him in your mind's eye. The Bible says Jesus starts his ministry when he's about 30 years old. He's 30 years old and he's unmarried. And here he is at high noon out at a well, and a young woman of some disrepute shows up. So Jesus violates the conventions, but he's recognizing he's in the mission field. and He's ready to go where the rest of the nation won't. And so he gives her some unexpected attention. And she comes down to the well, and Jesus says in chapter 4, verse 10, give me something to drink. Give me something to drink. He's alone. You say, well, why don't the disciples get him something to drink? Well, the disciples have already disappeared. If you look in your Bible in verse 8, he was alone at the time because the disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. And dismissing them was beneficial to this appointed conversation. They'd have only run interference anyway. Why? Because they would have been offended that he started to speak with her. He's young. He's unmarried. He's at the well. What's this woman doing here? Well, they all know why she must be here. There are some assumptions that can be made. So he sent them all. How many disciples does it ch take to change a light bulb? I mean, to get lunch. Well, apparently all of them. <laughs> no, 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 oh, no, no, I'm going to be fine. Off you go. Uh, no, I'm going to be all right. This woman pulls up and he says, uh, please give me a drink. Culturally, it's absolutely shocking. She's blown off her seat. And she responds in verse 9, the woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. 
And she said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Let me take that out of there and put it into culture. She says, I know who you think I am. And I know who you are. How can she know? Oh, Jews dress differently than Samaritans. He's immediately identifiable. Your, your nationality, as it is in many other cultures of the world, is determined by your dress. You wear certain colors. You wear certain styles of clothes because you belong to a certain group of people or a certain country. And she immediately recognizes the tassels on the bottom of his garment and says, that's a Jew. She said, I know what you think about us. Jews refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans. The verb literally there is don't use the same utensils. They won't touch the same stuff. They won't drink out of the same cup. She said, I know your cultural traditions. What is this all about? Again, Samaria should have been the mission field, but somehow we've got a nation of Jonahs who don't want to take the message to anybody outside their little circle any more than Jonah did. They were in violation of God's will and God's heart. Let's make sure we're not. Because God had to send his own Messiah into Samaria to do what the people should have done generations before. So Jesus violates the conventions and starts the conversation with a spiritually indifferent woman who could care less that he's alive. The second thing he does is he extends unsolicited mercy. He gives her attention, which shocks her, and extends unsolicited mercy. Verse 10, Jesus replied to her, if you knew the gift of God and what God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me to give you some living water. Notice the first thing. The first thing he says, although John has told us there's problems between these two groups, he doesn't talk about the problem. He ignores that, brushes it right off. That doesn't matter. You're a woman. I'm a man, she says. I mean, you know, the other way around. Whew, that was. Jesus is not a woman. Just, just so you know. And she looks at him and says, uh, this shouldn't be happening. He pushes it aside. I'm not going to argue. But if you knew the gift of God that God has for you and who you're talking to, you'd ask me and I'd give you living water. He starts out thirsty, asks her to give him a drink. Then he pivots and identifies her as the thirsty one and says, hey, I've got water. She's looking at him. Okay, a minute ago you want, you want water. Now I need water? I have the bucket. She clearly doesn't know what's going on here with this guy. But here is pure mercy because he says, if you knew the gift God has for you, the gift is a free gift. This is where evangelism starts. You initiate the conversation. You find your way to a common point of interest. And then comes the reality that you're offering the person without regard to their morality, God's mercy. Because God's mercy in its beginnings has no regard for morality or nationality or background or status. It's mercy. It's just mercy. Mercy is doing for others what they can't do for themselves. This woman has no idea who he is. This woman has no idea about the gospel. And Jesus knows that she doesn't know anything, so he dives in with both feet and offers her a free gift. If you only knew the gift God has for you, contrary to all religion, the gospel says in whatever state you're in religiously, whatever state you're in morally, God stands with his hand outstretched with a gift for you. James says it's a generous and perfect gift coming from above. It's a gift of mercy. And that's where our Lord starts. If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would do what, he says, Look at your text. You would ask me. You would ask me. 
What did we say when we were going through John 3 last week? Birth from above is a work of God. You can't participate in your own birth. All you can do is ask and believe. Jesus says there's a gift available. I'm here to give it. I would give it to you, this, this living water. What is this gift of God, this living water? Well, clearly we know from our perspective that he's talking about salvation from sin and reconciliation with God. And everything that's included in that package, mercy, grace, pardon, forgiveness, justification, power to live a new life, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, a river of blessing, flowing. Flowing. And he's put it all out on the table. You see, when sinners come before the judgment of God at the great white throne at the end of time, when they're all brought before the tribunal based on what our Lord says here and elsewhere, they will be sent off to a place where God is not, not because of the complete record of their sins. We all have that default setting. Why will they be sent? Because they didn't ask. They refused to receive. And the judgment is based on this fact that God's light came into the world. But people loved the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be what? Ah. They don't want exposure. Hmm. For the wages of sin is what? Ah, death. What are wages? Wages are something you earn. And Jesus doesn't offer her wages. What does he offer her? He offers her a free gift, but the free gift of God is eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Unsolicited mercy is being extended. This is the uniqueness of the gospel. It's a free gift to anyone who will ask, as the scriptures say. Romans chapter 10 says, anyone who trusts in the Lord will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone, did you see that? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be? Anyone who wants to can. You can look at that gentleman downtown. You can look at a young lady that you watch walking through the mall and shake your head. Just you remember, that's the mission field, not the enemy. And Jesus sat down beside one of those people who was not expecting him. And he gave him uncalled for attention. And then he offered them God's greatest gift, which is mercy. God empowering them to do what they can't do for themselves. They don't even know it's available. How will they know if you won't tell them? How will they know if I don't speak? They won't. You might ask, well, why is it described as living water? Well, half of it's just genius on Jesus' part. They're standing by a well. But the other part of it has to do with some Old Testament foundations. Let me show you one of them, shall I? Living water, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. For people, my people, God says, have done two evil things. They have abandoned me. And who am I, God says? The fountain of living water. And they've dug for themselves. Here's where we all sat. Here's where your friends are today. Here's where your kids are and your parents that stand outside the circle of faith. They're busy digging themselves a cistern that can hold no water.
I mean, they lived in a world where water was life. It was crucial. It was essential. Psalm 36, 9 said, God is the fountain of life. God wants to give this woman life. It's a running water. It's a flowing water. In John 7, 37 to 39, Jesus said on the last day of the feast, he stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink for the scriptures declare what? Rivers of living water will flow from his heart. God says, tell you what, you got a cracked cistern that won't hold you water. I'll bust through to an artesian well that bubbles up to eternal life for the rest of your life. And not just this life. It will flow until the next. You will never get caught short again. When he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to who? Everyone believing in him. Wow. It's a water that once you receive it, you never thirst again in the presence of the Spirit. There's the power for endurance. There's the perseverance of the saints. There's the refreshing of the believer. Once you receive the water, once this gift, this artesian well is received in you, it just flows and it flows and it flows and it flows, and it's a well of water springing up eternally. This is the gospel. Again, without regard to your past, without regard to your religion, without regard to your ethnic background, without regard to your cultural background, without regard to your financial status, this matters not at all. Whosoever will may come. For by grace... Are you saved through faith? And this is not from yourselves. It's what? It's the gift of God. It's not from works, not from anything you could do. Or some would be given to boasting. This poor woman is looking at him as someone would who is outside of faith watching me and saying, what's this shouting all about? John chapter 4, verse 11. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. This well is really deep. It was about 100 feet deep. Where are you getting the living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? We have been blessed by this well. It's still there, by the way. If you go to Israel, they can take you there. It's still there. The water's still flowing. She says, how can you do better than Jacob who gave us this well? This is skepticism. Again, mercy responds kindly, patiently. John 4, verse 13, and Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I will give will never be thirsty again. It it becomes a fresh, bubbling spring. Did you see that? Within them, giving them what? Eternal life. So we come to the third piece. It's an unparalleled blessing that is promise. Unexpected attention, unsolicited mercy, then unparalleled blessing. The Lord promises an endless supply of life, satisfying water forever, and he gets really specific. This is eternal. This is the fountain of eternal life. This is the fountain of youth. His point is unmistakable. This is permanent, consistent, full, satisfying, everlasting mercy and blessing from God to the person, he says, who will sincerely ask. She may not be totally sure, but she's caught on that there's something going on here. Verse 15, please, sir, she says to him, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I 
won't have to come here. Does she understand? She knows enough to ask. Whether she's caught the spiritual nature of it all, I'm not sure yet, but here comes verse 16. Are you ready for the next piece? Jesus is about to, about to set up a roadblock. You ready for the roadblock? Verse 16. And he said to her, go call your husband. Now that's a bold command. Go call your husband and bring him back. To which she responds correctly, I have no husband. What's number four? Unhesitating conviction is required. You see, some people at the point we were just at would have had them pray a prayer, but they'd have had a premature birth because something hasn't been dealt with yet, and that's sin. Oh, Nicodemus knew all about this part. Jesus did not need to cover this point with Nicodemus. He was well aware. He had 613 rules for a reason, you know. This woman, totally different kettle of fish. And he's looking for an unhesitating conviction. You see, God doesn't pour clean water in a dirty cup. If you and I evangelize purely on the basis of all the gifts God offered, everybody signs up and many of them walk away empty-handed because there's another reality, though this woman would prefer to avoid it, wouldn't we all? That confrontation moment about some of the things that we've done. But friends, remember, here, here, here's our problem. The wages of sin is death. So you come to the necessity of Holy Spirit conviction, and this is going to change her entire perception of Jesus and confront her in a very direct way. I would say at this point, what you all know is critically essential and necessary is to bring the individual face to face with the consequences of your sin. But can I say something? Some of you love a guilt trip. Give it up with the gospel. You're taking God's job, and he doesn't like it. Okay? This is what we call humility. Humility is knowing what's my job and what's his job. Well, if I guilt trip that boy, he's going to know that he's a sinner. You don't have to bother with that in the gospel. Jesus said this when he comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of guilt with regard to sin, righteousness, that's right living, and judgment. God says, you don't have to do this part. This is my part. You do your part, I'll do my part. In regard to sin, because they don't believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. So I'm going to provide it for you. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world who has sucked them all in and got them all under his influence already stands judged. Jesus said, conviction, my job. You see, the Holy Spirit's job is to bring the individual to know the weight of divine judgment, to be measured against the holy law of God, to understand the consequence of the offense against God, because faith is always accompanied by repentance. So with the Spirit's input, input and influence, Jesus recognizes she is an adulterous woman, and she knows the Old Testament law. Does he accuse her of anything? Did you notice this? Does he accuse her of anything? No. What does he do? Why don't you go get your husband for me? And the rest, as they say, is up to the Spirit of God. And he does his bit. Just what? Well, like all sinners, she doesn't want to tell the whole truth and miss out on this gift she's being offered, so she says, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, yes, that's, that's, that's true. You've correctly said you have no husband, but you've left something significant out. 
verse 18, where you've had five, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. Certainly, he said, you have spoken the truth. Did you notice that living together doesn't make a marriage just BTW on the way past? He did not acknowledge what was going on as marriage. Thank you. Don't let that one slip past you. Well, we know divorce was quite common among the Jews of Israel and also among the Samaritans, so we can assume the woman has lived this kind of life for some time. She's a repeat offender with five husbands. She's been through it a few times. Now she's followed the same pattern of living with a man who's not her husband. Biblically speaking, she's an adulteress living in an immoral relationship. Now she's exposed and she can't hide. And the most amazing response comes. The woman said to him, Sir, Sir, I, I, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now he's no longer a potential suitor. He's not some crazy duck at the well offering her wacky stuff. He is now an intelligent man because all of a sudden she has connected with somebody. And she, whoa, 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 prophet, the only guy that's going to dig up my history without knowing it. Now she feels the conviction because she knows he's at least a prophet. That's evident. And she wants to know more. And she says, so, 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 so let's, let's, let's talk about this. Uh, you say, you Jews, that we should worship in Jerusalem, but we have a temple over here on Mount Gerizim. Been here for generations. This is where we, we worship. And, um, okay, if I'm going to do this, where do I go? Where do I worship? Her soul is bowing slowly. She knows what being right with God is a matter of appropriate worship. She's now, did you see that quick flip? flip? Bang! All of a sudden she's trying to figure out, hey, where do I have to go to get this thing done? Holy Spirit works fast. In evangelism there's unexpected attentiveness, unsolicited mercy unparalleled blessing and then there's the necessary confrontation and the spirit's job of conviction to bring the sinner to the point of repentance and then the next thing that has to be dressed is where we are now unacceptable worship has to be abandoned she said tell me what the right thing is to do now now well, what, what do i have to do where do i have to go when you've got someone and they're following the line with you they didn't receive it at gift. They got convicted. They repented. And the first question then is, what do I do now? What do I leave behind? What do we go forward with? For narrow is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be. Isn't that what he said? Those aren't my words. Few there be that find it. She said, how do I get through? There's a right way to do this. And he answers. And if I talk about what he talked about, we'll be here till tomorrow. So let me just say this. This is a monumental text that offers the most definitive discussion from Jesus on worship in the Gospels. And it starts with a denunciation of all the external, external forms. So she looks to her past up on Gerizim, temple built long ago, still standing at the time. Is that where we go? Or maybe I need to go down to Jerusalem where you say the Jews worship? But she immediately recognizes, I need to worship, I need to bow before God, and I can't do it alone. And Jesus looks at her, woman, first stop, believe me. Like what I'm about to tell you, just, just, just take it. Why? Because nobody else is going to tell her what he's going to tell her now. The disciples won't yet. They're not here yet. The hour is coming, verse 23, and already is here when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. He said it's not about a place. 
Pardon me? It's not about a place. Now, we need a place because we live in Canada. It's cold out there. Thank God for all of you. We've got a place. We need to put a roof on this place, just BTW. <laughs> but we've got to have a place. But Jesus said, hey, listen, listen, listen. Place is, it's not about place. It's not about place. Her worship doesn't require a pray place. Her worship doesn't require a priest. It doesn't require a ritual. It doesn't require a song. It doesn't require a ceremony. It doesn't even require an offering. God forbid. God says, you live according to the truth from the heart. Bow to the one true God in your heart. We would say, confess Jesus as Lord and then live like he is. One final feature then, this woman, this wonderful conclusion, verse 25, she turns around and gives him what little religious knowledge she has, and she says this, Messiah's coming. I heard about him. So when he comes, he'll help us sort all this out? And the most astonishing words come back. Because to this point in John's gospel, nor any of the other gospels, will Jesus tell anybody who he is. In fact, when the demons speak, he says, be quiet. It won't be till about six months to a year later when he finally says to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And what do they do? They run a debate. to this woman of horrific background, unacceptable heritage, unacceptable lifestyle, non-religious, living totally in the culture, Jesus says these words to that woman. I'm him. Don't you ever be surprised that your well-trained child, that your lovely religious grandmother will fight for this and that you'll walk up to somebody on the street and they will get what everybody else is looking for in a heartbeat. Plus they come with such honesty, which says, where do I go? How do we do this? Jesus says to the woman, let me tell you, I'm him. And she looks at him. And he says no more. Because she got an unveiling of Jesus as the Christ that everybody else was trying to. Are you the Messiah or not? Jesus said, if you can't figure that out, let's wait a bit. Let's see if you can get there. Holy Spirit's at work. I don't need to tell you. But to this girl, come on in. I'm him. To the people his own people would not go and talk to. To the people that his own people rejected. He came unto his own and his own rejected him. But he walks into the house of his stranger. And the stranger says, come on in. And he says, who are you? And he says, I'm the Messiah. <sighs> She's ready for the truth and he's ready to give it to her. I who speak to you am he. And in response to her faith, her repentance, this outcast, this immoral, this ignorant woman that our Lord sat down to talk with, this completely disinterested party now wants the truth about the life of God that is eternal, that her heart is now craving desperately. She wants forgiveness for her past. In that moment, she believes and she repents. You say, how do you know? <laughs> did you see what she did? Look at the next verse. Verse 28. And the woman dropped her jar... <laughs> and ran <laughs> and ran all the way back to the village 
and did what every new believer you ever met does. What do they do? Tell everybody. <laughs> I mean, they tell everybody. Isn't that the best part? They tell everybody. And then all of a sudden, there's a stampede on the way out to the field. Now, some of them aren't there for good behavior. Because what did she say? She said, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. There was a bunch of men in that crowd who were rushing out to see who this fellow was before their wife found out. <laughs> uh, just real life, isn't it? I mean, you walk outside the lines and somebody says, this guy's telling everybody all about me. And you go, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> In another passage that is of the same story, it says, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he said, Behold, the field is our white unto harvest. You know what they saw? All these folks wore white turbans. The fields are white unto harvest, and the harvest was running across the field to find Jesus. He said, It's the laborers we don't have. He said, As soon as somebody figures out who I am, the rest... Come running. Are you ready? And the people said, after a couple of days, he stayed two days in Samaria, two days of seminary, and more believed in the word. And when the Samaritans came to him, they went back to her and said, we don't believe because what you said, we believe because we have now heard from ourselves and know that this one is the savior of the world. Let's pray. Jesus, you've come to save the world through us. Help us not to be so careful in the 21st century with all the careful political language we are supposed to use to miss out on, on the people that you're just trying to send across our path. The, the ones that we don't expect would even come, the ones that we don't even think should even listen, and yet you've been priming them before we ever saw them. And you're ready to reveal yourself to them in ways that some of us are still hoping for. Dear God, help us. We want to see your heart. We want to know your heart for our world. We see this promise of blessing and salvation to folks that are totally unworthy, among whom we are numbered, who simply have to ask, repent, and you will reveal yourself to them. Now, Lord, look at what we have learned today and give us an opportunity to use it, to be seekers of the lost, to bring your good word to them. Holy Spirit, come with us. You have a job to do that we cannot. Thank you for giving us this time together today. May we worship together with joy, enriched in your praise and your glory, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.